it as well. So for anyone who was unable to join us tonight, or if a um, husband or wife is caught at work or something, um, we'll still be able to get this information to you. So tonight we're gonna do introductions of our panelists, and then we're gonna have two presentations, and then we're gonna open it up to Q and A for, for all of you viewers. And so, as I mentioned before, um, if you at any point wanna put your questions in the chat box or the Q and A, I'll be tracking all of those questions and making note of them. And then once we get to the Q&A section of the webinar, then we'll um, then I'll, I'll get to all of your questions. All right, so I'm going to have, um, I'll start with Josh to introduce himself and go around the screen. Good evening, everybody. My name is Josh Bubar. I'm the assistant head of school here at Chapel Hill. Uh, I've been here just a little bit longer than Lisa. I'm in my 20th year now. Um, I began, began my career here as the English department chair basketball coach, baseball coach, and a dorm parent in the boys' dorm, and I've done a little bit of everything ever since. Mm -hmm. um, I'll be one of the presenters tonight, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions you have afterwards. Great. Thanks, Josh. I'm going to ask Nikki to introduce herself next. I am Nikki Turpin. I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall. This is my first year. Um, I will be doing a small presentation as well, and you are more than welcome to answer any questions. Great. Thank you, Nikki. I'm going to ask Susie from the admissions office to go next. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Susie Horan. I'm the associate director of admissions and director of financial aid. Um, I'm actually in my eighth year here, um, being Lisa's little sidekick. <laughs> um, and um, let me know if you have any questions. I've, I've been a lacrosse coach here and um, had a, done a couple other things. Um, so feel free to ask me any questions. Great. Thank you, Susie. Next up is Caroline. Hi everyone, my name is Caroline Finnamore. I am the admissions officer here at CHCH. I am also an alum. I graduated in 2013. Great. Thank you, Caroline. Um, I'll have the students introduce themselves next, um, beginning with Max. Hey guys, uh, it's kind of raining right now, so that's a problem. Anyway, uh, my name is Max. <laughs> um, I'm a current senior at Chapel Hill. Um, I used to live in Ashland. Massachusetts. However, I just moved down to the Cape. I live in Sagamore Beach. It's just a small village in Bourne. Um, I'm a day student. Um, however, this year I'm hybrid. I'm in person some days, remote some days. Um, I participate in theater tech. I am the, uh, I have managed the girls varsity volleyball team my junior year and I am in Calvary and I'm in a member of the our school's chapter of the National Honor Society. Great. Thanks, Max. And for those that don't know, the Cavalry is the um, student ambassador program here at CHCH. So we have a bunch of students who help out with different events such as these webinars, give uh, families tours both on campus and virtually, and just help out with um, a number of different events. So thanks, Max. Next up is Sophia. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Sophia. I'm also a senior with Max this year. Um, I'm from Wayland, Massachusetts. I'm also, oh, I am a day student. Um, some things that I participate on campus. I play on our girls um, soccer team, basketball team, and lacrosse team. Um, I'm also a student ambassador. Um, I'm in National Honor Society with Max also. I participate in student government and I'm also in our Students of Color Alliance Club. Great. And Sophia, what year did you start at CHCH and where did you transfer from? Um, I transferred here my sophomore year um, and I have been in Wayland Public Schools for like up until then. Okay, thank you, Sophia. And next is Lulu. Hi, I'm Lulu. Um, I'm from Arlington, Massachusetts, and I'm a day student. I'm a junior and I transferred mid-year last February. Um, I am on the soccer team with Sophia and I wanna, I am interested in doing lacrosse and I'm also on cavalry. Great, thanks Lulu. And then I'll have the parents introduce themselves next, um, beginning with Francesca. Hi, my name is Francesca Kalina, and I have a daughter, Sophia, who is our current senior at CHCH. We live in Winchester, Massa well, Massachusetts, obviously, um, <laughs> but we're from Winchester, and Sophia started as a freshman. She was in the Winchester public school system up until her freshman year, um, and Sophia does a bunch of different stuff. She does theater in the winter, theater tech. And then in the fall, she does cross country. Um, and then she has every spring tried a different activity. So she's done rock climbing. She's done ultimate Frisbee. She's kind of done a bunch of different things, which has been fun for her. Thanks, Francesca. And then uh, last but not least, we have Rachel. 
Hi, my name is Rachel Benson. I am the mother of Max Benson, who is a sophomore. Um, we live in Dover, Massachusetts, and prior, he started as a freshman at CH, and before that, he was at uh, the Dover Sherborne Public Schools. And he is, um, he's in theater tech right now, and he did the plays last year in London. Okay, thank you, Rachel. All right, mm -hmm. I'm gonna turn things over to Josh, who's gonna share his screen and present. And um, just a reminder to get your questions in the chat and I'll, I'll start tracking them. Thanks, Josh. All right. Uh, hello, everybody. I got I to get my presentation presenting here. Um, so welcome again. Um, really nice to have so many people here interested in Chapel Hill. Uh, what I'm going to talk, I'll give you a little bit of background about the school so you uh, know some things and then we'll talk about what goes on during the school day and use our academic and uh, co-curricular schedule as a frame. So, you know, as many of you probably know, we're in Waltham, Massachusetts, typically around 180 students, nine through 12, with um, on a year to year basis, a handful of postgraduates. Uh, in a more typical year, we ha are about 60% day and 40% boarding. This year, due to COVID 19, we've suspended our boarding program for the fall um, until, until January, and we're, we're looking to kind of open it back up at that point. Typically, 20% of, of our students are from another country, and roughly 22% of our students are domestic students of color. Um, here's our graduates from a few years ago, um, a lovely group. Uh, and this is an example of our schedule. So this is a typical week in September or in any month where we have a five-day week. And one of the things you'll see here is that our classes take place three times a week. So you'll see A block on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Thursdays or a D block on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Friday. And our classes, you'll note, are an hour and 15 minutes long, so 75 minutes. Uh, we really, really like this schedule. We adopted it about a decade ago. Um, and we've been really happy with it for a couple of different reasons. Um, one is that we feel like it takes away some of the frenetic pace of the school day that so many other schedules where you might meet with six, seven, or even eight classes a day can have. Uh, four classes feels a little more relaxed. You can even see that there's some built-in non-class time in between most blocks. Um, I think our students and certainly our faculty really appreciate that. The other piece is that in an hour and 15 minutes, it really encourages our faculty to do a wide variety of what I would call non-traditional academic activities. So one of the activities we engage in every year is our Senate simulation, uh, where our juniors and seniors take on the role of a sitting U.S. Senator. Um, they research the position, they, they research that person, they research that person's positions on different issues, um, the committee roles they have within their party, um, and then they spend an entire day in the fall, which we'll be moving to the spring this year, so we hopefully can have it in a little more traditional way, um, debating various bills that they've put together. Um, we're able to do this because we have plenty of time to do the kind of group work we want to do to set students up for success due to a 75-minute block. We also do a lot of work within the sciences. Our 75 minute blocks allow us to do labs. Many of those culminate in our science expo in every spring. And we even have the opportunity to take short field trips. We'll go back to the schedule and I'll show you, but in addition to the 75 minute block, we often have a block that adjoins it, which would allow a class, in this case, one of our language classes, to take a field trip that might be an hour and a half. Um, get off campus, see some things that they might not otherwise see. Again, this has been a little bit of a casualty of COVID at this point, um, but it's a pretty core element of our program in a more typical year. Um, here you'll see, for example, if I was teaching an F block class, I might say to my students, hey, we're gonna exit campus at 925, meet me at the, meet me at the buses, and we'll head out, we might get an hour someplace at the Decor de Museum perhaps, um, downtown in Waltham, um, or at some other museum or important place, and then be able to be back on campus so our students could have lunch. Um, one of the other nice things about our schedule is that we have Skills and Academic Support, SAS, built into the weekly schedule. So you'll see um, each of those SAS blocks, that's a class in your schedule. So if you have SAS during D block, you'll meet with your SAS teacher Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, we find the schedule really works for many of our students because Rather than having to meet with that teacher every single day, they have a chance to meet, make some plans for the week, execute those plans, come back and check in, make some new plans as they have to, execute the plans, come back and check in, and then make a plan for the weekend. Um, again, really effective use of time. You'll also see here <clears throat> a fair amount of time set aside for advisory, class meeting, 
assemblies. And those are where we do a lot of our social emotional work with students. Um, our advisories are typically groups of four to six students with one faculty or staff member. Um, they meet on um, Tuesdays typically to review um, progress notes. One of the things that you'll find at Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall is you're always being informed. Um, our teachers write weekly notes to our students about their progress in the class. Those notes are available to students and teachers and advisors on Tuesday morning. And then on Tuesday afternoon, students will meet in their small advisory group to go over those notes. And then those reports become available to parents on Wednesday morning. Uh, what we think this does for our students is allow them to really have a sense of where they are in each of their classes. And if there's something that's gone a little bit awry, maybe a missing homework assignment, um, a quiz that wasn't quite where the student wanted it to be, they have an opportunity over the course of Tuesday and um, to take care of that, to self-advocate, um, to make the changes they need to make. And then when the parents see the report on Wednesday, they have the opportunity to say, yep, absolutely. Yeah, that went, that went a little sideways, but I took care of it. And you know, Mr. Bailey and I are all set right now. We also create time for grade level meetings. Um, so obviously in a pre-COVID photograph, um, this was, uh, I think this was Max and Sophia's class when they were ninth graders. I wonder, Max, are you in there somewhere? I think yeah, you are. Yeah, that was, that was my freshman year. I remember we watched like some video and it was in the learning commons. You can see Mr. Cook is right there. Oh, yep. both of the days, mm. but yeah, that was so. Year. Yeah, so we used that time. Um, we might watch videos as a whole group. And we might have, and that might lead us to some bigger conversation that we'll either have as a whole group or in breakout groups. Um, we might have different presentations. You'll hear from uh, Nikki a little, little bit later about our diversity, equity, and inclusion work, which is also a significant part of that time. Um, so we, we try to build in time during the week for that work um, at all at all grade levels. Um, what you're not going to see here, um, but which happens at the end of the day, is our co-curricular program, and our co-curricular program is both our interscholastic sports and our theater program and then some other activities that we offer. That typically takes place about 15 minutes to half an hour after the end of the academic day. Um, our theater program uh, is incredibly robust. We have a brand new performing arts center um, that, we, that just came online um, this past February. It is a lovely, lovely space um, and it really befits the dedication that the kids and the faculty have to the program. And roughly 50% of our students will participate in at least one semester, one trimester of theater, either on stage or as part of the theater tech crew in any given year. Uh, we also have a pretty robust athletic program, um, and, but it's an athletic program that has a place for all different athletes. Um, so in looking at this, this group of our <clears throat> girls basketball championship group um, from a couple of years ago, there are young women in this picture who have played a lot of basketball. Uh, they had played basketball, youth basketball growing up. They're playing high school varsity basketball now. There are also young women in this photo who never played organized basketball before they came to Chapel Hill, but they decided to dive in and give it a, ch give it a chance. Um, and I would say while we have a very competitive athletic program in many ways, there's really a place for lots of kids to try new things, to jump into things that maybe they gave up a little while ago, um, but they want to re-engage uh, re with. Um, it's really, there's a place for everybody in that program. Um, and now we're back to the schedule and, you know, I want to talk a little bit about COVID-19 and, and our response right now. So as you may know, <clears throat> we're currently in school in person every day. Um, so all of our students are coming to school five days a week. Uh, we, ex with the exception of a handful, about 20% of our students who are boarding students, some domestic and some international who don't live locally enough to be, co to commute, um, and a handful of students. You heard Max mention it in his introduction. Max, because he's a fairly long distance away, is just joining us a couple days a week and then in our classes remotely otherwise. Um, one of the things we're able to do because we have smaller classes is we're able to um, exceed the Department of Ed guidelines for physical spacing during those classes. Um, we're also able to exceed all the recommendations um, around food service, um, around seating at lunches, um, and we've been really committed and I've been incredibly impressed with our kids and our faculty, staff, our families um, to universal mask wearing, face covering wearing across the campus. Um, you know, our kids are doing a great job. We've had a lot of success. We have not had um, knock on wood any illness at this point. Um, and it, it's really been a successful fall to date. 
in that way. Uh, this slide is a list of all the colleges, the different colleges that our students have matriculated to in the past five years. I don't want you to read it through it. There will not be a quiz later, so don't worry about memorizing it. But I really want you to think about this. We graduated 224 students over the course of those five years. Those 224 students went on to 116 different colleges. We really emphasize that college is an opportunity for you to find another school where you really fit, where you can really be somebody, you can be known, and you can have opportunities, not just in the classroom, but outside of the classroom, because we know that that is vital um, for post-collegiate success. We know that what that means is we can't just look at a really narrow group of colleges that somebody else thinks is right. So we, our kids go to a really wide variety of colleges. By contrast, um, one of the schools that we compete with locally, athletically, and you know, certainly we have a lot of cross applicants, had roughly twice as many graduates in the same amount of time. And those 450 graduates went to about 145 different schools. Again, lovely school, but for us, providing a real breadth of opportunities for our kids is incredibly important. Um, this next bit will be for Lisa to talk a little bit about um, what we have going on this fall. Things have changed a little bit, um, but in some ways in really cool ways. So Lisa, I don't know if you wanna take, take over from Actually, here. I'm gonna, um, I might wrap up with this, Josh, the last two slides, just um, to talk oh, about sure. the application yeah. process. I think it might make more sense to, to finish with that. So I might have you pause there um, and come back to that at the end. Just remind me in case I forget. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, great. Thank you, Josh. Um, Nikki, I'm going to have you share your screen. I hope you're able to do that. We forgot to test that before we went live. <laughs> I think we're good. Can we see that? Yeah. All is good. Yep. Awesome. Yay. So hi, welcome again. My name is Nikki. Um, I am the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion here at Chapel Hill Chauncey Hall. Um, DI is really important to our school. Um, this position is new, but definitely one that both students and staff felt was necessary in, in order to continue um, the really important work that is making sure that our community is equitable and includes and makes everyone feel as though they belong. Um, and so my position is really important in making that happen and ensuring that that um, occurs. Um, and one of the ways that that happens is through training and education um, and anti-racist action planning. So this summer we came together, myself and the heads of school, um, and really worked on making DEI initiatives that were practical and strategic, but also not overwhelming. Um, and we really looked at what does our community need right now and what do we see our community needing in the future? Um, and this goes from not only just the school, but also to our board. So it was very important to many to us that our board was on, on, on board with us in making sure that DEI was at the forefront of what we, we were thinking as a community. Um, and so that's led us to be able to have really great meetings um, right now already, but also thinking ahead to how do we want professional development to look? What do we need to support our staff and our faculty um, and our students to ensure that they feel that they can be the best anti-racist human being possible? Um, and how do we hold each other accountable for making sure that this work is happening? You know, I, I, I often think about, you know, having the data is great, but when you don't have an action plan after the data, it means nothing, right? So we are really putting, putting to work the things that we have seen that our school needs support in. Um, we're doing a lot of professional development with ourselves as a group, but now we're going to start bringing in some external, some internal people and external people to come into the independent school that we're at and speak, run workshops for parents, run workshops for kids, run workshops for us. Um, so we really have a clear idea of where we are in supporting our students of color and our students in general. And one of the other ways that we do that is really looking at our curriculum. Um, I love to say that we are a school that is, is aiming to be mirrors and windows. And what I mean by that is that our curriculum, our studies, our books, not only show students a mirror of themselves, but a window into someone else's world. 
Um, and so that's really important when you're discussing diversity and equity because sometimes your classes might not have a lot of diversity in them, but it's making sure that you as the teacher bring that diversity in with the people that you study, the people that you read, the people you talk about. Um, and this is something we can do and we do do through all um, subjects. So it's not only in English, it's not only in history, it's in science, it's in math, it's bringing in those voices of marginalized groups to show that we, we want you to know more about these people because they matter. And then on that added layer is making sure that our lessons are accessible to all our learners. So as Josh just stated, we have a, a few remote learners. And so we wanna make sure that we are equitable in ensuring that they're accessing the curriculum just as though they were here on campus. Um, and sometimes that means the teachers are meeting after classes are done for a couple extra minutes with those students in during office hours um, or during some, another time in the day, but really making sure that they feel comfortable with the material that they're being presented with, even though they're not here in the building with us. And another layer of our DEI work is understanding mental wellness and actually mental health in general and supporting our students of color and understanding the trauma that um, right now, many of them are experiencing day to day by just turning on the TV or opening up their phones. Um, so really making sure that we can support them um, and be non-triggering as they navigate this country and everything that they're going through um, with you know, COVID and everything else. Um, and then also making sure that they have some real connections out there. So just recently, um, we had some um, alumni students come in and speak for uh, our Hispanic Heritage Month. We, had, um, we have a great program coming up with another alumni meeting um, where they're gonna just kind of connect with some other local college students and just see how it feels to be a person of color at you know, predominantly white institutions together. Um, so really making sure that we're supporting them with each other and also their outside, commu outside community, um, as well as using our ad, um, advisory time, which you saw within our schedule to really talk about things like voting um, and voting suppression. Um, discussing Hispanic Heritage Month and the names that we don't often hear about and the stories that we don't often see um, placed on in that time frame, really bringing in new yet not really new people to their um, awareness, so to speak, and forming that community organically. So I will leave this open for questions. Great, thanks Nikki. All right. Can you, um, do you mind just hit stop sharing and then there it, is. Did it work? There we go. Yes. All right. Great. All right. So, some great questions coming in. Um, the first one um, mentioned office hours and we saw office hours in the schedule. Josh, can you just talk a little bit more about how that's structured and how that works? Yeah. And then I think for the students, I'd love to hear about how office hours goes for you guys too. Um, Sure, so office hours happens four times a week. Uh, it occurs right after, right between the first academic and second academic block of the day. And it runs for about 35 minutes typically. Uh, our ninth and 10th graders have mandatory scheduled office hours in a typical year with, um, they rotate through their core teachers. Uh, this year we're actually sending all of our students, ninth and 10th graders with their advisor, where it's a chance for them to check in with their advisor again during the week get some work done and then also check in and see if they have a teacher that they need to see to get some extra help to help study for a test or a quiz um, get some get something started on a presentation or a paper something of that nature uh, our juniors and seniors which is who we have here today they typically manage the office hours a little more independently and so they will show up with to see a teacher they'll make an appointment they'll email somebody and say i really need to see you tomorrow um, I'm pretty sure this group is pretty actually pretty good about that. I think we have a particularly good group of self advocates here in, with us tonight. Um, and that's really important because we think that's an incredibly valuable college skill, right? The ability to reach out to a, a teacher, to a professor and say, look, I need to spend some time with you looking at this particular thing. Um, that is one of the things that for many of us got us through college. And we know that when our students might maybe hit that rough patch in the college experience academically, it's going to help them get through it as well. Right. Lulu, I saw you kind of chuckle a little bit when uh, we spoke. Did you find office hours helpful? I know you coming from public school and you mentioned coming mid-year. So you started um, late in the year. So I just wanted to quickly explain that a little bit. So um, over my years here, we've always had um, families reach out and say, you know, my my current 
my student's current school is just not the right fit. And most oftentimes it's a public school. Um, you know, can we start the application process for next year? And, you know, we said, well, if we have the space and we have the scheduling available, you know, why not look to transfer that current school year rather than waiting a whole year and just undoing a lot of stuff that, you know, a lot of progress and just kind of having um, kind of not the most successful year. Um, so each year we do have students begin anywhere from after opening day um, up until about January, February is the latest point because we do have trimesters that we have students begin. Um, even this year, for example, right after the public schools began, um, many of the towns are fully remote. I had a handful of, of families reach out just to say, you know, it didn't work in the spring, it's not working now. Um, do you have space to entertain an application? And we had three new students start within the first week of school. Um, and Lulu um, was one to, to enter last year and um, we do have some space again. Um, but, but Lulu, did you wanna talk about maybe your experience with office hours, just coming from public school and just having access or if you had another comment to make? Um, so I come from like a pretty big high school. There's only one high school in Arlington and my grade is 500 kids. So what I really love about office hours is um, like you said, like you can choose what you want to do with it, but I tend to use it to like do work so I don't have to do it later. Um, a lot of the time I'll go to my advisor's room and do work. Sometimes I'll like Zoom with my teachers if they can't meet directly. But mm -hmm. I really like office hours because it's just like, it's nice because it like splits up your day so you're not just going from class to class but you also have like another opportunity to like ask questions or get help if you need it mm -hmm. great thank you max or sophie or parents you want to add anything to that topic or you don't have to um i can kind of touch on it so definitely like um, so I came in as a sophomore, so I only had one year of those like assigned office hours, but I'd say like as a senior this year, I'm utilizing them like more than I ever have really just cause like the workload is definitely a lot. And like, I don't know, coming from public school, I never had like free time during the day to do homework. Like, yes, we had a study hall, but that was like 40 or 50 kids in this huge lecture hall. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas like office hours, it could honestly just be you and a teacher one on one for 45 minutes. So I think that the time is really good, especially because if you're in like a bigger class setting, which is not huge, it's like 12 kids, but like if that's larger to you um, and you're not really able to get all your questions out, it's a really good time to like have that one on one like space with a teacher and just like really get to what like you might have missed in class. So for me this year, especially, like, I don't think I've had one free office hours because, like, it's just really good time to, like, utilize and, like, I don't know. For me, it's really helpful. Great. Thanks, Sophia. Yep, Francesca. I just had one quick thing um, from a parent perspective with the office hours. And as Josh said, for freshmen and sophomores, they tend to be more mandatory. And then they are not mandatory for juniors and seniors. And so at first I was concerned about that when my daughter was a freshman and a sophomore because she's not someone who advocates for herself. She's not one who seeks help from teachers. Um, so I was worried about that, but then when she, after having it mandatory for two years, when she became a junior and she became a senior, she was so used to having them for the first two years that she actually started going to the office hours on her own and asking for help. So it really did teach her how helpful they are and how to advocate for herself. So I, I was worried, but she goes to them, um, as Sophia was saying, not my daughter, Sophia, but the other Sophia here, um, <laughs> she goes to them a lot as well. So it's, it's really nice. Great. Thank you, Francesca. All right. Um, next question. Um, can you touch on the spring trip? Is it open to all grades? Um, so we have something in the spring called spring sessions, and it's typically the week leading up to graduation. Um, and it's, um, they're all, it's all driven through our faculty, you know, collaborating together and coming up with different trips, um, both um, abroad, um, nationally, locally, and on campus. So it gives students plenty of choice. And the purpose of that is to really get them off campus and to um, have some experiential learning and, and get to see the world in a different way. Um, 
I can give some examples, but maybe Max or Sophia, do you want to talk about one of your spring session trips? Or yeah, you... I can talk about two of mine. So um, unfortunately, um, my junior year spring session got canceled because of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. I was actually going to Banff National Park in Canada. And when it got canceled, I was pretty bummed out about that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I actually locked out on two of my spring session trips. My can, you really, can you mention first what you were supposed to do in Canada? What, oh, like, I was, oh, what I was supposed to do? I was supposed to go to uh, Banff National Park and kind of like learn about the outdoors and like kind of mm -hmm. see the world, two different parts of like Canada and the world. And that's mainly what it was about. Mm -hmm. um, it was, it, it, it looked beautiful. I've seen, I've seen pictures of it. I've always wanted to go there, but due to COVID, I couldn't go out there. I was pretty bummed out about that. I've, I've, I haven't been to Canada in a while, so. Yeah. Um, so two of the trips that I was able to do, um, my freshman year, I went to Colorado. Um, I was one of the three freshmen to go on that trip. It was a very fun trip. I learned a lot about the outdoors. I did mm -hmm. some community service work. Um, it was a lot of fun. Got to, it's really nice to be out west. It's very different from the east. It's like, you know, mountains and everything. It's awesome. Learned a lot about the outdoors. And then my sophomore year of high school, I went down to Alabama um, to it learn about the civil rights movement and kind of like the history of, you know, black history in our country and i went to a lot of these really cool impactful museums around alabama i went to uh um i forget what exactly what exact museums i went to but i went to a bunch of different ones it was really impactful and good to learn about you know our country's history and everything especially um nowadays mm -hmm. so yeah i think i learned a lot of those two spring sessions and i and hopefully i can actually have a spring session this year oh, fingers crossed <laughs> yeah fingers crossed yeah cross hard <laughs> so yeah thanks max for sharing that Sophia, did you have any? Yeah, so last year, oh, not last year, actually, two years ago, my sophomore year, I actually, so I just wanted to, like, kind of do something chill for a spring session, because I'm just, like, you know, laid back person, my traveling just stresses me out, so mm -hmm. I did the mural painting um, spring session, which was actually really cool, so basically what we did was during the day, um, we'd start at, like, nine, I think, and we'd go to, like, um, one of the trips we took during the day, we went to Jamaica Plain and we looked at a bunch of like local murals, like all around like the local area. Mm -hmm. um, but we went off campus to do it. And then we'd come back and we got to paint like a mural that we came up with um, in one of the like halls of the boys dorm. Mm -hmm. um, so that was really fun. I think it was just like, it was like fun to paint, but it was also good bonding, especially cause like my sophomore year, um I was new so like it was just like a really fun way to close off the year and just like really solidify those relationships that I had made like going into the summer mm -hmm. um so it is mandatory that they do choose something and it's open to all grade levels um but for example last year we were supposed to have um a trip to Spain um but unfortunately got canceled but we give priority to the seniors and work our way down so hopefully by the time a freshman is a junior or senior they can go up on those trips depending on um on how many students sign up for those trips but um you know different different experiences like that so every year they are some are similar and some change and are new um but great question and then another question has to do um with homework, how much time on average is devoted to homework on a daily basis? And um, just referencing the schedule again, because all the subjects only meet three times a week for 75 minutes, you're not having every subject every day. So it does make homework um, much more spread out and you're not having five or six subjects every night to do. Um, but I would say Josh on average for a ninth grader, maybe a half hour per subject, would you say? Or not? Oh, you're muted. So sorry. Maybe maybe for a ninth grader or half an hour. I, I, I mean, I'd be really interested, you know, from the student's point of view. I mean, I think this is a great question for you all to answer. And, mm -hmm. and I think one of the important pieces is, and I think Sophia mentioned it, there is, I would call it outside of classwork, because I would say many of our students that really get into a good groove are finding 20 minute, half hour, 40 minute chunks during the day to get an assignment done here, assignment done there. And then they come home and there maybe isn't as much work as you might think is that accurate students yeah so i can kind of talk a little bit about homework i'm the type of person that like needs to get everything done so i have nothing at night because i work better like at school um and if i'm gonna be honest with you guys like i rarely ever have like over an hour of homework every night and that's like for all of my subjects so like 
a lot of the teachers also realize that the 75 minute block is much longer than like most public school blocks. So what I've found in like my two years here so far is that teachers are usually very willing to give class time as well um, to do work. So like I like junior year is supposed to be very stressful and I honestly never found myself like up past like you know midnight doing work like I found it very manageable. Mm -hmm. Great thank you. Could talk about this as well. Um, so also it really depends also for homework I feel like the workload definitely goes up a little bit as you your grade you know as you go up in the grades and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but also what um, what I find is that it depends on the top what of the time of the year and the trimester because usually in like the beginning and middle of the trimester it's pretty laid back in terms of how much work you have and also like you need to think in, about these like longer term assignments and sometimes we'll get papers and projects and we'll be given deadlines so I guess you can kind of just manage that time to just do it over do it like throughout the nights and stuff um, that's just another thing that um, that came in mind when I thought about that. Um, and also, uh, also, I think, I think that I really like about, about the schedule is the fact that I don't have, at a public school, I would be having every class every day. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of like the fact that I get more than one night to do it. So I'm like, I'm also just like Sophia, I like to get my work done as soon as possible. So I don't really have to worry about it later. And I can just kind of use the night to relax and, you know, get ready for the next uh, day and the next grind. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Make sure you keep that up in college. Don't let it pile up. <laughs> yeah, I'll try not to. <laughs> yeah, good Lulu, skills. Did you want to comment too? Um, yeah. So I'm the opposite of these two. I'm a terrible procrastinator and <laughs> often find myself cramming a little bit. I've definitely gotten bad better as I have learned ways to get my work done, but I definitely utilize a lot of time in school to do as much work as I possibly can. Um, I'm a junior, so I definitely feel like I have a pretty large workload. Um, but I would say that like we have a lot of free time to do homework if we need to. And it's pretty, it's pretty manageable. Like I'm not terribly stressed. Mm -hmm. Rachel or Francesca, do you want to add anything from the parent perspective, just kind of coming from public school to CHCH? I'll add, I feel like it's much more manageable, at least for Max. And I think it's um, those office hours and the way the schedule is just, I guess, reiterating what they were saying, but it's it's definitely different. There's he's He always seems to have it under control and it's never an abundance where I'd be hearing about it. <laughs> Great, thank you. Yes, Francesca. Sorry. Um, the other just quick thing that um, I noticed with the homework compared to public school is that the homework that they're given has, has more purpose, whereas with the public school, she was getting a lot of busy work just to keep her hours and hours of homework, whereas with CHCH, um, it is very manageable, but also what they're given is much more purposeful. I, I don't know how else to say it. Maybe Josh, you can explain that a little better, but it's not just busy work just for the sake of, you know, do a hundred math problems tonight or what have you. I don't yeah. know. Lulu, is that what you wanted to comment about? Oh no. I, I mean, I do think, so let me, let me, add, let me kind of build on that a little bit, Lulu, and then I think you should, you should finish us off. Um, the, yeah, I would say we really encourage our teachers to make homework meaningful. Again, not to do a hundred problems, math problems, when 10 would get at what A, the student needs to do to practice, and B, what the teacher needs to be able to see to assess the student's progress. That's really what we were kind of working at it from both ends. And, and I think the students appreciate that because nobody likes busy work in any way. Um, and I think the teachers really can point to, point to the, the homework for the students and say, oh, here's what I learned from this let me help you relearn this piece if you didn't quite have it, or let's move, let's move ahead because we don't need to do this over and over again because you really have it under, uh, you know, under control. Thanks. All right, Lulu, and, uh, and I know Sophia had something to add as well. Um, I just wanted to add also, 
along with all the opportunities you have to talk to your teachers in school, they also have um, teachers on deck at night, like they have a schedule that they send out where, and whenever I have like a project that I'm stressing out, it seems to work out that my teachers are always online. So a lot of the time, um, I find it really nice that your teachers are always available. And also most of the teachers at Chapel Hill are really good at answering their emails. So if you email them, they'll email you within like 15 minutes usually, which is very helpful, especially when you need that help at night. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Lulu. And Sophie, I think you had something to add as well. Yep. Um, I just wanted to go back to like me, Max, and Lulu's point about like time management. I know Lulu touched on like how she's gotten better. Um, I feel the same and I want to like credit that to SAS. Um, so for me, public school. Hmm? Can you just remind everyone what that stands for? Oh yeah. So SAS is the Skills and Academic Support Program. Um, so for me in public school, I had like absolutely no academic support um, whatsoever, like elementary school, middle school, my freshman year in high school. Um, and I think that SAS was really helpful for me because it's like three or four students with one teacher um, and you spend part of the class time actually having like time management and like organization lessons. Um, so I just wanted to like touch on the fact that like that is definitely a step up from public school especially for me because like having that academic support has like really helped me like be successful um i went to having like all d's and c's to getting either honor roll or high honor roll all trimesters so i just want to credit that to sas of course yes one of our hallmarks thanks sophia Great. Um, the next question has to do with our college counseling program. Um, and if parents or Francesca, you're kind of going through that right now as well with Sophia. But could you speak to that like different, like from the public school experience versus kind of what CHCH provides? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I can't say enough positive things, so you might have to shut me out, Lisa, at some <laughs> point, um, about the college experience. Um, so the college advisor, is that the title, college advisor, Lisa? For Director of College Counseling. Yep. College Counseling, yeah. For um, Her name is Brooke Fink, and she runs the program, and she's absolutely phenomenal. Um, she's just incredible at getting all the kids motivated to get their stuff done. She provides a one week summer boot camp um, where all the kids, I mean, this year, this summer it was virtual, but a boot camp for the juniors so that over the summer um, during that one week, they get pretty much their common application complete. So before Sophia started her senior year, because of the boot camp, her common app was 100% complete. Um, they write their college essay, the main essay in the spring term of their junior year in their English class. So those big ticket items that stress parents out insanely are completely <laughs> taken care of. Um, in addition, she meets with each student multiple, multiple, multiple times, gives them the list of things that they need to do, helps them get the list of things completely done to the point that um, college application deadlines are coming up November 1st, depending on how you're applying. Um, but the first deadline is coming up and that's in about two weeks. And I have been completely removed from it because, and I'm a hands-on parent, but I have been mm -hmm. completely removed because Sophia, who needs hand-holding during a process like this, um, has gotten it completely done with Brooke. Um, and if she were in public school, I would be holding her hand through the whole thing I'd be online constantly trying to figure the process out. Um, and I have to say, I almost feel guilty because I almost don't know what's going on with my daughter's college application, which is very unlike me. Um, it's, it's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. Um, I'm already stressing about how I'm gonna get through this with my son, who is a sophomore at Winchester High, because I've gotten very spoiled with Brooke, um, who's taking care of everything. So she, she's just phenomenal. Um, she edits, I mean, even little things, um, Sophia had a college interview yesterday and she immediately was writing a thank you note to the person who interviewed her. And I said, why don't you run it by Brooke? And so she emailed the copy of her thank you note to Brooke. 
Brooke responded immediately, made a few edits, you know, and said, it's great. Just make these edits and then send it. So, you know, just little communications like that. Um, and Brooke is also incredibly available to parents. Um, you know, I send her an email once in a while and say, do you have a quick 20 minutes to Zoom? In fact, I just did this recently because I feel so removed from the process mm -hmm. that I wanted to make sure as a parent, <laughs> is there anything <laughs> I should be doing? And she said, Sophia's got it covered. You're good. So anyway, um, it's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Absolutely phenomenal. Great. Thanks. And so oh, just one more thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. Just one more thing um, that I love about Brooke, the college counselor, is that she's very, very, very good at finding the right schools for your children. Um, and I have to put a lot of emphasis on that um, because she really gets to know your child at the beginning of junior year. She meets with them, she gets to know them, and it's not just about looking at grades and at curriculum and at activities. It's not just about that and then sending them off to apply to certain schools. Mm -hmm. um, and so I find, I find that critical because CHCH is such a good fit for my daughter. And so I want to make sure she goes to a college that's a good fit. And um, she's very good at that. Mm -hmm. I'll stop right. now. <laughs> well, no, thanks. <laughs> very good. And um, Max or Sophia going through the process now as seniors, anything you want to add to that about the college process or? I mean, I like agree with everything that Miss Kalina just said. Um, I'm like very like in school, I like really need my handheld because like usually when I have no deadline for things and like I'm just set to do work on my own, like I procrastinate like crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, but Miss Fink is really good about like staying on top of like reminding me to get everything done and like I'm going to be applying to like schools in like less than a month, which is crazy to me. But like <laughs> what's crazier is like, I'm not even stressed out about it. Cause like, I really have like literally everything done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to touch on the fact that like Miss Fink doesn't let you apply to schools that like would not be a good fit. So I feel like at public school, I found that like the college counselors were very focused on like sending students to like, schools that like people knew their names mm -hmm. um but miss fink is very focused on finding a school that would be the best fit for you so i had a school on my list that was just not going to be a good fit um i have ulcerative colitis which flares up from stress mm -hmm. and i sat down with miss fink and i was just like this school is like going to like trigger me it's just gonna like cause so many problems and she was all on board with like putting my health first Mm -hmm. um, which felt really good because like it shows that she really genuinely cares about like each and every student that she works with. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Sophia. Um, Nikki, this question is, is for you. Um, you said that you were new to CHCH this, this year and um, what drew you to the school and, and the work that we're that the school's trying to accomplish? Yeah, um, I could I can speak to that very openly. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it is very popular to say that you are looking at diversity, equity, inclusion in your schools, especially when you're a predominantly white building, but it's not actually happening within your school and you don't have your staff supporting you. Um, and as a person of color, when you walk into spaces, you automatically know when that's actually not the real vibe, as the kids say, of the building, right? Like people aren't on board with this. So when I interviewed, um, I interviewed multiple places, but I, my heart was already at CHCH because the vibe was there. I knew that people were ready to do the work. They were invested in doing in the, the work. Um, and when I heard that the head of school and the board were supporting this position, um, it, it, made, it made it feel as though this is not for show. And now being in it, I know it's not for show. <laughs> Everyone is really on board. Um, everyone wants to see these changes happen. Um, and, you know, it takes really strong leaders. Josh and Lance are amazing at that and, and steering us and making sure that we stay focused on what we need to do. Um, mm -hmm. But it, it, is, it is quite a venture out there. And I will say that Chapel of Chantiala has its heart in the right place, but it's also, it's doing the work. And so it's been really great to be at the school even just for the last couple of months and seeing how much progress people are um, doing. In, in, I saw a question about the academic curriculum and it's like, yes, people are so excited about putting um, 
non-white people within their curriculums and just being guided to, to know who to put. Um, so like we talked about Zita Carr, who is a Cherokee or Dakota Nation female who was a political activist, right? So we were able to add her, her story to our conversations about voting because what's happening in a couple of months, voting, right? So let's talk about this woman of color. Um, we talked about um, Ida B. Wells and her right as her fight for suffrage. Um, and so we've been able to have these real conversations about what's impacting our kids and our communities, but also bring in these voices. And people are really happy about being able to find and learn about new people that they haven't heard of and introduce them to their students. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, on the other side of that is also just making it so natural. So our, you know, our head of math is talking about how do we use statistics that are real, right? How do we talk about things that are happening like the wildfires and water shortages and how COVID's ex affecting students and people rather of color, how do we talk, use those numbers in our math, right? To be really like actually having real conversations and not just using an abstract number, letting kids see, oh, that's real. And oh, that's actually a real fact. So I think it's absolutely amazing the work, how we're incorporating DI into our community and curriculum. Great, thank you. We're very fortunate to have you, Nikki. <laughs> Um, and just for parents and students, um, the Boston area in particular um, has many, many independent school options for families. Um, but what other schools, if you could speak to that, did you look at and what ultimately made you decide on CHCH? Who wants to answer that? <laughs> oh, I can answer it for like for me. I think. Um, I only looked really at one other school, um, but I think for me, Chapel Hill was just like very much a community. Um, even on my tour, like there were kids coming up to me, like getting to know me, even though like I wasn't even enrolled in school yet. Um, I think that like my interview with Miss Pellrine just went so good. Like I wasn't stressed whatsoever. Like it felt more like a conversation. So I think that like, it was really like the community aspect and like the support that I knew I was going to get from like the faculty staff and the teachers. Um, it just felt like a family rather than just like, okay, yeah, you go to school from like eight to three every day. Like I actually want to like get up and go to school. Like I, I would rather be at school on the weekends. And that is crazy for me to say because <laughs> I do not like school. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just like, it's more of like a family rather than like, just a school. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point that you bring Sophia with the coming on weekends. So we are essentially a day in boarding school, but for those students who are a day, day student, you can essentially take advantage of the, all the boarding components, except for sleeping in the dorms. <laughs> you know, you can stay for study hall, you can have three meals a day there, you can come on the weekends for weekend activities or meet a group out in Boston or Cambridge or, or you know, whatever it might be. Um, so your social activities are kind of already already set up for you. We have about 10 to 12 different activities on and off campus on any given weekend. So it's it's the best of both worlds, right? If you're a day student for that, that regard. So great, thank you for, for answering that, Sophia. I appreciate that. Lulu, did you wanna add something? Yeah. Um, I didn't really look at any other schools. My process was really fast. I can't even tell you like how fast it was, but basically when I came, I just needed a change and I came in toward and my tour guide was like one of the sweetest people ever and she we it wasn't it didn't really feel like an interview or a tour we kind of just like talked and we just clicked really well and she kind of said all the right things and we had very similar like she came from a public school also and we just had very similar struggles and strengths and also um I like Sophia said, I go to summer camp and I've been going since I was nine and that's something that's really important to me. And so when you walk onto campus, like everyone's outside and like everyone talks to each other, like sometimes you sit with your teachers at lunch, like it's not, it's not like a school, it's like a community. And um, I really like all the different relationships you can have with your teachers and people around you. And I love what you said, Lulu, like you're bringing your strengths, but also realizing you might have to work on organization or time management, right? It's a college prep school at the end of the day. And I think, I think our teachers do an amazing job at really having that healthy balance of challenging a student to where they can be challenged, but then layering in that support so they can handle the curriculum. So it's not, not overwhelming for, for these students. I see a lot, a lot of students coming from public school just anxious and kind of overwhelmed. 
by the rigor and it's not that they're not capable of learning it but just kind of when you teach it differently and have the schedule we have in the relationships i think it makes it a lot more attainable to reach those goals so great i know we're coming up upon eight o'clock and i just wanted to um quickly just kind of go over options for you to explore further um, and have those opportunities as well as just touching upon the admissions process in these days of COVID. So Josh, do you mind bringing that slide back up, those two slides um, where you ended? Okay, great. I'm just gonna move my screen here. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Um, so we are actually inviting families um, by appointment to come on campus for tours and interviews. Um, for families that aren't comfortable with that, we're also offering a virtual experience as well. Um, so an on-campus tour and interview would be Monday through Friday during the academic day. So you can see everything happening that we just spoke about. Um, Caroline is, is wonderful in working with families. Um, you can either book online or she can accommodate a, a, an appointment for you. And we'll, you'll have a student-led tour guide to show you around campus. That way you'll get to hear from more of our students and kind of hear their story and their experience at the school. And if it's virtual, they'll also be able to do a virtual tour with you and spend some time with you as well before the interview. Um, we also have a couple um, of options as well. We have, for the first time ever, we're hosting our a drive through open house. We're trying to figure out a way to get families off of Zoom and doing Think different to learn about a school and so why not on a Sunday afternoon spend half hour 45 minutes um, kind of touring touring campus from the safe safety of your own car um, we'll have sev seven different stops on campus with a QR code for you to scan and then a short video and welcome from either a student or a teacher um, and some highlights of what happens in that space so something really fun and interactive to do and then on November 1st we'll also be doing a virtual open house with more presentations and Q&A's and um, more specific to either our amazing arts de um, department we have both um, uh, visual and performing arts, whether it's our athletic program, um, whatever it might be, um, we're going to be having that virtual open house on November 1st. Um, I think Matt just put in the chat box the link for that. So if you want to um, register ahead of time, that will make kind of your drive-in experience a little bit quicker that day. Um, so that's kind of a little bit more about what we're offering. Typically, we do offer shadow days for students to come in for a day to see a class. However, at this point, we're putting those on pause, but maybe after the new year, we might be able to offer that for families. And then we do a revisit day um, after acceptances um, go out on March 10th. So Josh, if you want to just go to the next screen, I can just kind of go over the step-by-step -step as far as um, applying to CHCH. So we have our own application or we also offer the standard online application through SSAT, the common app. So whatever's easiest for you, it's basically the same information that we collect. Um, this year we are making the SSAT optional because um, they're only offering a, a at-home test and that might not be accessible for all families. Um, but I did wanna mention if a family does have um, educational testing such as a neuropsych report within three years, we would actually prefer that information happy to talk further about that um, we do require an interview and we do not need a completed application before you do your interview you could do that at any point so basically February 1st is the date you need to keep in mind for um, an application deadline as well as your interview um, and then March 10th as I mentioned earlier is the notification date for when um, we send families those decisions we do um, have a financial aid page and um, affording CHCH page on our website um, we understand that you know during these difficult times and just making CHCH more accessible to a wider variety of families. We do have either need-based financial aid or a scholarship program. So Susie, who's on with us this evening, um, is the Director of Financial Aid and can certainly answer any questions you have um, about the financial aid process. Um, and that deadline is also February 1st. So you have plenty of time to get all of this done. As Sophia said, we try to make it as stress-free as possible. At the end of the day, it's about best fit um, on both sides. You know, We just wanna make sure that we get you all the information that you need to make an informed decision. Um, and again, we have plenty of parents and students available to speak with you as well. So Josh, if you wanna stop sharing at that point, that's the last slide. Um, and Susie just shared her email in there. All of our information in the admissions office is um, available on our website. And I just wanna say thank you for spending the, the past hour with us. I hope this was informative. If there are specific questions that we weren't able to get to this evening, please do reach out to us and I can put you in touch with any of the students or parents or, or Josh or Nikki. Um, thank you panelists for an amazing job just um, 
being upfront and honest and, and speaking about your experiences here. Um, so with that, I just want to say good night and hope to see you all maybe at the drive-thru. All right, take care.